Peter to Rome to sentence Nazareth. We have no law to put a man to death. We need him crucified. It's all you have to do. We need him. We need him crucified, it's all you have to do. Talk to me, Jesus Christ. You have been brought here. Not at home. I am wrong. Talk to me, not at home. Where is your kingdom? Talk to me, Jesus Christ. Look at your Lord Jesus Christ. I'm the greatest man. Or to be locked up. But that is not a reason to destroy him. He's a sad little man. Not a king or God. Not a thief. I need a crime. Oh, yes. Yes, I like it. Oh, thank you, lady. Mm -hmm. It's been a year, so I thought it was time. Accentuated my baldness. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Oh. Yeah, 
Dolinar. Is Riker? It's Riker. Riker? Thank <laughs> you. 
Is Nolter. Nolter. Sorry. Ms. Pekatowski? Ms. Pekatowski? Dolinar. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, Ms. Peeler. Sorry, Ms. Peeler. Is Dolinar here? Uh, I guess not. Alrighty, good to see you all. Um, continuing our talk or our look at Islam. Um, before I continue, I wanted to uh, um, mention something. It was asked by a student. Fortunately, uh, let me see. Uh, hello. Guglielmo, Ms. Hurst, I didn't see uh, Ms. Muhammad Kony. No, okay. well, maybe we'll come later. Okay, because I wanted to, I still wanted a clarification, and I wanted to clarify um, when I was talking about um, the flag of Saudi Arabia, and I made a comment, and I wanted to make sure that uh, I clarified it uh, now because. You know, things come into my head, ideas and connections are being made in my head, and sometimes I verbalize them without following through and talking about what the connection I was making in my head. And remember, I talked about this is the flag of the country of Saudi Arabia, and they have the Shafada here, and I mentioned they have a sword, and I wasn't sure what the sword was there for. I looked it up. It's supposed to symbolize strength and power, but also I think it refers to the fact that the Saud family conquered all the tribes of Saudi Arabia and brought them under their kingdom. Um, so it has that historical value, but my thing is Islam, and I didn't want to give the impression, I was worried that I might have given the impression that I was saying like Islam equals the sword, i.e. violence, and that's not the meaning that I was trying to give it at all. Um, no, in fact, as I went over the, the name of Islam, I mean the root of the, the word for Islam comes from this idea of peacefulness, okay, peacefulness, a feeling of peacefulness, but also peace with God and stuff like that, and you get this peacefulness by surrendering to God. Um, but when I was mentioning, like, uh, I, I, I mentioned, like, you know, uh, there's the sword, and maybe that will explain what comes after. And what I was make, I didn't make the connection verbally, but what I was making in my mind was what will come after, which we're going to talk about today, um, that, uh, you know, almost from the death of Muhammad, you have internal struggles that lead to violence, unfortunately. 
but I wasn't trying to make the connection like Islam equals violence. That wasn't my, my point at all. So I wanted to make that clear. Okay, moving on. At the time after Muhammad, and uh, Muhammad dies, as you know, I mentioned in the last class, I did forget, uh, it's here in my notes, but I forgot to mention where he's buried. He's buried in Medina, the, the city of the prophet, okay, where he spent apparently, I guess that's where he kind of located himself, even though uh, Muhammad, uh, Muhammad, excuse me, even though Mecca is his hometown, and, you know, that that's the holy site with the Kaaba and where he received his revelations, he actually, um, uh, he actually, stays in Mecca kind of like as an area or base of operation. So that's where he's actually buried. He's not buried in the city of Mecca, which surprised me. I didn't really think about that until it was pointed out in something I read. And I'm like, oh yeah, you know, it's not Mecca. Um, so Muhammad dies. Now, as I already kind of said, well, already said in the last class, the last time we met, um, there, there's a problem. You know, if, if Muhammad, Muhammad, unfortunately, never uh, designated a successor or a process for a successor. He never seemed to say what was gonna come after he was no longer with the group. I kind of averted to the fact, averted, that in his final sermon, his farewell sermon, he talked about, you know, I've left you the book of Allah, which seems to, he seems to be referring to the Quran, the revelations that he was receiving. And I was supposing that it would seem like he thought that that would be enough. Okay, maybe that's what he thought, but it wasn't enough. And so we're going to come into two major problems after the death of Muhammad, almost immediately after his death. And actually, in the case of one of these problems that occurred during his later years, um, a little side note that I'm going to leave. The, I might have mentioned this already, but I'll mention it again. I'm going to leave the further historical treatment to the textbook. Like it talks about the different empires that came about, the Umayyads, the Abbasids, and all these other Islamic empires, the Mughal Empire, which we talked about with Hinduism. But I'm going to leave that to the textbook. So for more information on that, for testing purposes, read the textbook, please. Read the textbook. And also it throws in some contemporary things that have been going on in Islam. So for this, those historical things, please read the textbook, the chapter in the textbook, and I'm going to focus mainly on some things that I think are important to the religion and important to know. The first thing I'm going to mention is the idea of succession. Who should succeed or should anyone succeed Muhammad? When Muhammad died, he left no obvious successor, no person. He didn't, you know, it wasn't like Hulk Hogan, you know, and you that's when you know the Hulkster is about to bring some smack in the in the squared circle, as they say, even though it's a square, it's not a circle. But <laughs> anyways, um, yeah, Mohammed never, you know, pointed to someone and said, OK, this person should succeed me, nor did Mohammed leave any real provision for a successor to lead the new community. So he didn't choose a person. He didn't lay out a process, nothing. He just dies. And so there's a vacuum. And so you have these two major issues. The first I'm talking about is succession. Yes, I know I misspelled succession on the PowerPoint. It deserves another S, okay? So I'll have to correct that. But anyways, it's succession, with is succession. The idea of a successor or the, the word successor, one who succeeds in Arabic is khalifa, khalifa. So we just come down to us in English as the word caliph, a caliph, okay? A caliph is the name for someone who has succeeded to the role of the Prophet Muhammad in the Ummah, is a caliph. You could kind of connect this, although the words don't mean the same thing, to the idea of a bishop in Catholicism and Catholic Christianity. When we talked just talked about Christianity, and it went over the whole idea of the apostolic succession. Okay, the same idea, khalifa. In fact, exactly the same, same word. But a bishop is a successor to the apostles. The bishop, you could say, to use the Arabic expression, is a khalifa to the apostles. I already mentioned, but I'll, I'll just mention it again, that, you know, perhaps 
in Muhammad's farewell sermon, he had this idea that the Quran, the book of Allah, as he calls it, which had been given to him would be enough to guide the community. Um, and in fact, there's this, um, you know, there's some interesting traditions from Muhammad called the two treasures, the two treasures uh, during his ministry, during his receiving of these revelations, um, we have stories, there are extra stories that talk about how Muhammad was and things he said. And apparently seven, several times during his ministry, he mentions these two treasures that he has left to the community. Literally in Arabic, it means weighty things, okay? But in English, it's often translated as treasures. Why? Because, well, precious metals, like gold and silver, stuff like that, they're, they're heavy, they have weight to them, heft. So sometimes, I'm just telling you that because sometimes you'll see it called, you know, the, the par parable or the story of the two weighty things, but I'm going to stick with treasures. So the story of the two treasures. Muhammad sometimes talked about giving two treasures to the Ummah, to the, his community. Number one was the Quran, the Quran. That was the first treasure. The second treasure, he said, was the people of my house, which was an, uh, a way of saying his family, his blood relatives. So two treasures, the Quran and the people of my house. The second one is going to be a problem because, and this is mentioned, I think, in the textbook by uh, what's in Robinson and Rodriguez, that you know, by by keeping things within the the family of Muhammad or trying to keep things the power within his family, like those who um, that really kind of pushed out people who were not blood relatives of Muhammad but still accepted his message. And of course, later when Islam expands, you have people who have no connection at all to the family of Muhammad, you know, they're, they're not even Arabs, <laughs> but they accept the message and they're kind of pushed out on the margins of the authority structures in Islam. But, you know, that that was the culture he was in, you know, family, your family relationships were paramount. So these were his two treasures, the Quran and his family. So you'll see how that kind of can help can give some guidance to his community about what they should be looking for. Muhammad had had many wives during his, his life. He had been married many times, sometimes to multiple women, <laughs> you know, at the same time. There was nothing unusual about that. That was part of the Arabian culture. It was not unusual to have more than one wife, and Muhammad was no different. However, Muhammad had had no male child survive him. You know, he had had other, I mentioned he had had daughters, okay, but he had no sons that had survived him. Um, which would have made things a whole lot easier for the community because they would have just followed their culture, which would have been the eldest or the, mo the nearest eldest blood male relative, his son, his nearest son, would have simply been accepted as his successor. But there were no sons, so, there were, so it complicated things. So what do you do? Well, in, in the culture of the time, they had two possibilities. They had two choices to make. The community can either decide to choose the best person for the job, the best person for the job, or they could choose to go with the bloodline, to stay within the blood relationship and within the family. Oh, I do think our baseball players are going out for a game. Go with God, my friend. Or maybe they're bringing baseball players in to play a game, in which case, boo! <laughs> Go Cougars. Uh. Da, 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 da. I always wanted to play baseball, but I could never hit the basket. Just couldn't get that ball in the basket. Kind of killed my professional career. Anywho, so choose the best man or choose a blood relative. Choose the best man for the job. So someone who is favored, maybe who is favored by Muhammad during Muhammad's life that Muhammad liked and therefore would be someone that would do a good job in leading the community. Um, the other, as I said, a blood relative. And that second one, I have a little asterisk there, or I have an asterisk next to number two, because according you know, in Arabian culture, uh, of the time, that was really the normal procedure. You know, that was what was expected, that you would choose Muhammad's nearest blood relative if you were going to choose anybody to be a successor for him. The nearest blood relative was this man, 
Ali ibn Abi Talib. He was the nearest blood relative. He was a cousin of Muhammad. So there was that family relationship, but there was also a marital relationship. He had married one of Muhammad's daughters, but he was also a blood relative. He was a cousin. However, this other gentleman, Umar, Umar, that we'll talk about, we'll talk about both of them later, but Umar um, puts the kibosh on that. He intervenes. Umar was, Umar was a very strong-willed man, um, very strong-willed in his opinions and what he thought was right for the community. And he um, intervenes and he convinces the, the Muslim community that they should, they should go with the first choice up there, the first possibility, which would be choosing the best person for the job, which might have been Ali, but it might have been somebody else. So he directs the community in that way. And as it turns out, they choose another person who is close to Muhammad and even favored by Muhammad, this man, Abu Bakr. This is not a misspelling. B-A-K-R is how it's spelled. Abu Bakr. This, uh, this action by Umar and the choice of the community for someone who's the best um, was, was the majority opinion, okay? The majority of the Umar decided, yes, we'll go with who will be, we think, to be the best leader. And they chose Abu Bakr. However, there was a significant minority that said, no, not no you should choose by blood relationship and that should, should have fallen to Ali. And still to this day, these two groups are, are part, are, are the two main groups in Islam, okay? And the group that favored Ali still to this day does not accept this decision. They believe that this decision was invalid because Ali by right should have had the succession to Muhammad because of his family relationship. So here we can already see the seeds of a split, the seeds of problems within the community over this idea of who should succeed. You have most people going with Abu Bakr and saying, okay, let the best man do the job. But then you have the significant minority group saying, uh-uh, that was completely invalid. Um, stop the steal. <laughs> you know, from my pilots, you know, but that shows their anger. They, they never forgot it. These uh, successors, uh, the first four successors especially, um, are called the four rightly guided caliphs. This word rightly guarded, rightly guarded, this word rightly guided can also be translated as upright or righteous. So you could say the righteous caliphs or the upright caliphs. In Arabic, it's ar rashidun, rashid, means righteous or upright. R is a version of the in plural, so the rightly guided ones are Rashidun, which, as I tell you for the definition, is the Arabic word for the four immediate successors to the Prophet Muhammad, and it means rightly guided. So the four, and here they are. I give you their names: Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali. Okay, these are the four men. After these four, the whole caliphate idea fall, go, becomes, falls into disarray, it becomes very confusing and complicated, and there are all sorts of disagreements after these four. These four are pretty much accepted by all Muslims as a, well, I shouldn't say that, uh, because the Shiites will never accept these three. They only accept Ali, the caliphate starts with him. But these four are recognized by most Muslims as the four original caliphs and the best. Um, Oh, caliphate. Yes, the uh, the order of caliph or the system of governance of the caliph is called a caliphate. Just so you know, a caliphate. It's uh, the system of the caliph. A caliph is the person, and the caliphate is kind of like the concept of having a caliph. Okay. So these four represent the caliphate. There will be later caliphates, but as I said, after these four, it gets complicated and confusing, and there are all sorts of disagreements um, about who who came, who should have come after them. So, anyways, um, the second issue is is violence. Unfortunately, is uh, the war what are called the wars of apostasy. Sometimes in Arabic, uh, you know, sometimes people will use the Arabic terminology, so that's why I give it to you. So you'll see it as. Al-Rida, al or Arida, 
but Kurub Alvida means wars of apostasy, wars of turning back, I guess you could say. Or also sometimes they're called in English the Rida Wars. And the word Rida comes from the Arabic irtada, which means to retrace one's steps. So kind of like, you know, you walk up to someone and then, you, you know, you go back and turn on them and you, you walk back the way you came. So, you know, you're retracing your steps. You could also say, if you wanted to use it in you know, like American colloquial English, you could say going back on your word is another way of understanding your tada. But literally it means to retrace to your steps, the path you came from. Okay. Uh, so you have uh, the wars of apostasy as the second issue. During the lifetime of Muhammad, many of the desert tribes, okay, this is all pretty much desert, Saudi Arabia, um, the Arabian Peninsula, many of the desert tribes allied themselves with Muhammad and accepted his new religion until he died. After he died, they considered the allegiance broken and they just went back to their tribal ways. So, here, and this is in Arabic, I believe it's in Arabic, it's certainly an Arabic style script, but you never know sometimes, this could be Persian, this could be you know, Farsi, this could be Urdu, which also use the Arabic script for their languages, so I'm not sure it's exactly Arabic, but nevertheless, you get the idea, this is the Arabian Peninsula, the country of Saudi Arabia, here is Mecca, city of Mecca, up here is Medina, and these green regions are meant to show the caliphate, okay, under Abu Bakr, the first caliph was Abu Bakr. So up here, the two cities of Mecca and Medina, down here, apparently, there was another place of influence, okay, and then all of this. So once Muhammad died, all the, the tribes that had been allied out here, they, they stopped their allegiance to the caliphate. They will not recognize the caliphate of Abu Bakr, and they stop paying taxes. They go back to their tribal ways, they give up essentially they give up islam they don't follow it anymore and they and there were economic consequences they didn't pay taxes there was a tax on members of the islamic community um, by which they collected money from people and this was used to help the poor or build mosques and religious buildings or to you know fund army armies because they started sending armies up north okay to, to start spreading spreading their thing and so they need money for that. Well, these tribes leave and they just, they don't pay the money anymore. They're not gonna pay this tax to the leadership. Um, you also have the development that some of these tribes even claim to have their own prophets. They seem to, they cl started claiming they had their own prophets who were receiving their own messages from God. So like Muhammad wasn't unique. They're like, we have our own guys and we have a message too from God. So you have these rival revelations showing up. From the perspective of the caliphate, the leaders, the successors, this was apostasy. This was turning back on what you said you believed before. Apostasy here, I've on the board, means to stop believing in something. You abandon what you believe and you refuse to believe it anymore. It's apostasy, like turning, in Greek, I believe it means like turning or standing away from something. So you stop. You know, I don't believe that anymore. That's over there. That's away from me. I believe this. It could be nothing, but I don't believe that anymore. It's apostasy. You believe, but now you don't believe. And you get and I, a sense of the idea of the mindset in, in your tada in Arabic word, word of retracing your steps, where, you know, in their minds, in their minds, you know, a person is walking up to the truth. You know, you're stepping up to the truth. Hello, truth. Say, shake truth's hand, pat him on the back, or her, you know, uh, pat truth on the back, give truth a hug, you accept the truth. But your tada, apostasy means you are retracing your steps, which means you have to turn around, turn your back on truth, and you slink away to error, you know? You're retracing your steps. Well, for Islam, it's easy to join Islam, not easy to leave. It kind of makes me think of that song, Hotel California, right? You know, you can check out, 
<laughs> or you can you can sign you can come anytime you want you can come to hotel california but you can never leave you can check in but you can never leave right um and so yeah the, the idea of abu Bakr and the community was that you accepted the truth of islam you can't go back into error and in fact we have to fight you now to force you back into the truth and hence you have wars wars so muslims start military campaigns against these various tribes that had apostatized, had left, left the faith to forcibly bring them back into Islam. And as it says, and one of the things I read, the Oxford Dictionary of World Religions, that the first event in Muslim history is the war of apostasy, al-Vida. This is like the first real event after in the history is this this war, you have to, people leave, and now, no, you can't leave. We're going to bring you all back. And so on this map, thinking of the sword in my head, I noticed, I wasn't, I didn't have this in my mind when I said it, but it was just fortuitous, you know, uh, what's the word, serendipitous, that this map was made, and the guy uses two crossed swords. These are all the battles that were fought, bringing these, these tribes back in to the faith during the Rida Wars. Okay, whoops. Now I'm going to talk about each of the Kalis. The first cop, whoops. The first Kali I'm going to talk about is the first Kali. Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr. Consider the first, I should, I should have said this before in the other class, but anyways, um, and I guess I'll say it later when I talk about Sunni and Shiite, but uh, the majority of Muslims consider Abu Bakr the first caliph, I should say, but the significant minority that objected and thought Ali should have been, they do not, they do not accept, they do not accept Abu, or Umar or Uthman, Ali for them is the first caliph. So when I say Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman is the first three caliphs, that's the majority opinion amongst Muslims, but not all Muslims would agree. Nevertheless, Abu Bakr, the first caliph, died 634 AD. I should have put this on the PowerPoint, I apologize. I mean 634 AD, not Anno Hajire. Yes, Mr. Krebs? Not Anno Hajire, no. I'm using the Western calendar, which I did the math already while you weren't looking. While you weren't looking, I came over here. I did the math. Anyway, which would be the year 12 on the Jire, according to our according to their calendar. Okay, 634 when he died, 622 was the Hydra. And so 12, I believe it was 622, wasn't it? Anyways, who knows? God knows. Uh, you should put that as an answer on some of the tests for the multiple choice. Make that the right answer all the time. God knows. Okay. Okay, of Abu Bakr, he was the first adult male convert to Islam. Now, I, I'm assuming that means that there might have been females who converted before him, but he was the first adult male, and I guess also that could mean children converted, male children, but... He was the first adult male to convert to Muhammad's um, religion that he was preaching. And Abu Bakr became a close friend of Muhammad. In fact, um, he was Muhammad's father-in-law. Muhammad um, had, married, had married into his family, had married one of his daughters. So there was that marital relationship, um, which for me, so they're related through marriage, which for me as an outsider, I might've thought, well, isn't that good enough? Um, but no, that doesn't matter. The Ali party was no, has to be by blood. Absolutely. No marital relationship is, is better than a blood relationship. So anyway, but he, but he was related to uh, Muhammad through marriage. He was called or nicknamed Siddiq, the truthful or trustworthy one. He was true and trustworthy because of his faithfulness to Muhammad. 
And it was during Abu Bakr that you basically start having these wars of apostasy. And some of the things I read, some of the books I read, they said that some, there were, you know, even during the final years of Muhammad, there have already been some, I guess, skirmishes with some of these tribes that were, you know, trying to, uh, you know, either, I guess, leave or somehow oppose Muhammad. Oh, and I forgot to mention that. Well, I mean, even when you're when you're redoing the readings from the Quran, and one of the readings from the Quran, I think it's in Surah Two. You know, it's because you know I was listening to it um, uh, in the car while I was driving over here, um, and you know I noticed that you, you you might have noticed in the reading there are portions of I think it's Surah Two in the Quran where Muhammad talks about people who were imitating his way of getting the revelations and trying to imitate the way he spoke his revelations, which I think is a reference to these people in some of these tribes who are also trying to imitate him and maybe steal some of his, his glory, his, his thunder, say, hey, I'm getting revelations from God too. And they imitated his, 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 uh, the way he was getting, getting revelations. Um, so there were, in the later years of Muhammad, I think there were some skirmishes with these groups to kind of put them down, but it was during Abu Bakr's caliphate that he oversaw the military campaigns against these rebellious tribes. However, I mean, once he, I mean, he did see, think that he needed violence to bring them back into Islam, but once these tribes were conquered, he was very respectful. He treated the leaders, the conquered leaders of these tribes with great respect which was politically good. I mean, it was a smart thing to do because instead of just massacring everybody, um, as sometimes groups do when they win, he said, no, you know, we've won, we've beaten them, and now we want to bring them back into the fold. So we would treat them with respect. And that had the effect of not only inducing these tribes, tribesmen to reaccept Islam, but even to become some of its most active supporters become, um, you know, supporters and promoters of Islam. He also scored, if you look up here on this map, he also scored a, a major victory against the Byzantine Empire. This, these sections up here, you can't see everything, but this kind of pinkish red represents the extent, the frontier of the Byzantine Empire, and this yellow is, I believe, the Persian Empire at the time, this other empire, Persia. Uh, and, yeah, they, they uh, Apparently, I guess, got up to the, uh, an Islamic army, a Muslim army got up to the frontier, somehow met a Byzantine army and defeated them. So that's, that's interesting. Of course, it will smell trouble for the Byzantine Empire from that, <laughs> you know, because Muslim armies will continue to just, uh, you know, um, nibble away and, and, and uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Not nibble away. I mean, you know what I'm saying, but they were, pick away at the frontier of the Byzantine Empire over and over again for centuries until they finally bring it down and conquer the Byzantine Empire. So that's under Abu Bakr starts. He also oversaw the integration of um, Islam into Arab culture. I mean, in, you know, it, it's Arabia, so there's Arab culture. So. He uh, saw that you know the, the faith that they believed, the religion that Muhammad preached, um, without giving up anything in that religion, the ideas, but he oversaw integrating it into the culture, so it would be more acceptable for people to accept Islam. Um, they could, to the extent that they could, you know, without changing the beliefs of Islam. Um, so he oversaw that integration, and, and that's what you want. You want people to be happy. You, you want the transition to be smooth. So you don't want to uproot everything because some things might have no opposition to living as a Muslim. So he oversaw that, you know, kind of allowing, you know, what can be preserved in Arab culture can be preserved while integrating Islam into it and, uh, and you know, purifying it by what he believed to be the truth, the truth of Islam. Abu Bakr dies and he is buried next to Muhammad. The, uh, the next caliph is this man, Umar, Umar ibn al-Khattab. Sometimes in older English, or more traditional English, he will be referred to as Omar. There's nothing wrong with calling him Omar. It doesn't, you know, it's not meant to be a denigration. It's just a traditional spelling. You know, I, for my purposes, I'll follow Umar, although sometimes I'll slip and say Omar, but it's not really a slip. They're both the same. It's okay. But I'll try to, you know, they try to follow more closely to the Arabic spellings nowadays. So Umar, all right, 
who dies in 644. He is the, the, the second uh, caliph, Khalifa. Originally, Umar was an opponent of Muhammad. He's almost like a, a Paul of Tarsus figure from Christianity. At first, he's an opponent. He opposes the message of Muhammad, but later he becomes a believer. He is nicknamed Farouk, Farouk. Um, and so you, you might see that with his name sometimes, just like with Abu Bakr. Sometimes you'll see Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, Abu Bakr, the, tr the trustworthy. Um, Farouk means a distinguisher, distinguisher, one who can distinguish between truth and falsehood, between true what's true and what's a lie. That, that, was, uh, that, that was his nickname. Um, according to the story, uh, Muhammad apparently declared that um, God would have made Umar, Umar the prophet, if I hadn't come first. <laughs> Yeah, so, yeah, you know, so he's saying, you know, God, Umar was such a great personality um, and uh, Muhammad appreciated him so much that he said, basically, you know, God would have made him the prophet, would have given him the revelation of the Quran, uh, just if I, Muhammad, had not come first. <laughs> I beat him to it. Uh, and when I, I read that, it's, it's interesting because uh, it relates, it related my man, mind back to something we learned in Judaism. Um, if you remember uh, Ezra the scribe, this man who after the destruction of the kingdom of Judah and the Babylonian exile, uh, the temple has been destroyed. Remember it's uh, 587 BC, uh, the Jerusalem temple had been destroyed the first time, yes. And the Jews are sent into exile for a number of years and then they come back and one of the fi leading figures in that um, resettlement is the, that man, Ezra the scribe that I talked about briefly, okay. And I gave you this quote that, you know, which comes from Jewish tradition that had, uh, had, had that God would have given the Torah to Ezra had Moses not come first. Remember that, you know, had Moses not come first, Ezra was worthy to receive the Torah. So it's a great compliment um, from a Jewish perspective. But you see the same idea here. Muhammad's like, you know, oh, Umar would have been uh, would have been worthy to receive the Quranic revelation. Just I beat him to it. Had I not come first. But that shows you something about, you know, Muhammad's mind and how much he appreciated this man. Umar was forceful. I already mentioned that he had a forceful will. He was a forceful personality and energetic. And he was also a great organizer. He was a very good administrator. And it is Umar who is the main constructor of the Islamic empire. Um, an empire, you know, you have a country but if a country expands out and starts to assert control, <clears throat> what happened there? <clears throat> Thank you. Um, moves out and starts to expand control of other countries and cultures, then you have an empire. It's not just you and your group and your space. Now you, your group is controlling other groups that are different from you. you have, that's an empire. And that's what happens under Umar. You have the spreading out from Arabia, from an Arab culture into other areas of the world that are non-Arab. So you start having, and, and spreading the religion with it, spreading Islam with it. So you have an Islamic empire. So under, you know, Umar, uh, where I got this from? The library, the Babino library, databases, yes? All sorts of stuff, science, philosophy, history, there you go. You sign in, it's all there. Simple, right at your fingertips. I had, they had this article and they had this picture, so snap, don't tell them. Don't send their lawyers out. Well, I'm giving them credit anyways, and it's for educational use, so that's fair enough to use that thing. Um, after the of the Middle Ages, they just had this map showing the conquests during the time of the caliphs, but also a little bit afterwards. But under it's under Umar that before this, you had, of course, the wars of apostasy and that Abu Bakr, they were able to bring back, um, you know, as you can see, all of the free Arabian Peninsula back under Islam and under the control of the caliphate. But under Umar, they start pushing out. So they push out north into Syria and places like Egypt and Persia. And now, now you're getting into an empire because 
you know, these are non-Arab cultures. These are these are not, and and they're main, and they're not, they're they're not Muslims. They have no connection to Islam. So within 12 years of Muhammad's death, you have um, the Caliphate exerting control over regions in Egypt, northern Africa, almost all the way uh, or halfway across northern Africa, I, modern day Iran, even up into the mountains of Armenia, the Caucasus Mountains up in Armenia, and into the Byzantine Empire. The frontiers of the Byzantine Empire are lost to, uh, to Muslim armies. Umar established religious and political institutions that helped to carry Islam into empire, but also to kind of solidify the basis of the Islamic empire and of Islam itself as a religion. So for example, Umar, and this, some of this is, or some of this stuff, I'm, or I should say all of it, I should, I should say some of it. Um, you find this in the textbook. They mention this in the chapter on Islam that these are some of the things that Umar, Umar did. He established a welfare system. So from those taxes that were being collected from people from, from the community, the, the alms giving and whatnot could be pooled and could be used to help people who, poor people who needed help. They all, it was also under Umar, this is an important point, it was also under Umar that the calendar was established, the calendar that's based on Al-Hijra, yes, the Hajira, the migration of Muhammad and his followers to Medina from Mecca. This is it's during Umar that this calendar, this this Muslim calendar is developed based on that date. So he establishes the calendar based on Hijra. And with the expansion of Muslim power, you now have all these non-Muslims and what do you do with them? So it was under Umar that they started establishing regulations for these people who were called Dimi. Dimi. These are what were called, and this word in Arabic means those who are quote unquote protected. They're protected sects, which is kind of a euphemism. I mean, because they, what are they being protected from? You know? <laughs> but they were protected. They, they would not accept Islam, but, you know, but they weren't going to wipe them out either. They, they left people alone for the most part. Um, there were, and there were certain regulations under the time of Umar that, um, he instituted to, to deal with you know, the situation of people who were not Muslims and were not apparently going to become Muslims anytime soon. A lot of them did, but some of them were just like, no. And so you have countries like Egypt, which at the time was a almost completely Christian country at the time um, before the Muslim invasion. It's still very Christian. There's still tens of millions of Egyptian Coptic Christians, they're called Copts, and uh, in, who are in Egypt. Even though, if you think of Egypt, a lot of people, if you thought to ask them about the religion of Egypt, they're going to think Islam. You know, which is true, but there's still a significant numbers. And in fact, if you believe the Coptic Christians, the Muslim government, which is in power, consistently undercounts them in the censuses. Make it seem like they're not as big a group as they really are in Egypt. But this was historically. Christian at the time. Syria was very Christian in the Holy Land. Of course, there were a lot of Jews, I already mentioned, sprinkled throughout Jewish communities. Um, you had groups in Persia. There were some Persians, there were, there were Christians throughout Iraq here. But in Persia, you had a lot of people called Zoroastrians who were not Jews or Christians, but this ancient monotheistic religion called Zoroastrianism, one God, okay, Zoroastrians, who had their own prophet and their own sacred writings. So you had that group. So what to do with these people? So under Umar, they come up with a system for, for dealing with people under their rule who are or they're subjected to their rule, but they're not Muslims. I would say that, you know, they they especially Jews and Christians. Um, I mean, in comparison to what say Christian empires did to people who are not Christians, I would say I would rather be under the Muslims. Because <laughs> they they even though there was it wasn't it wasn't persecution i mean you lived under certain regulations you had to and you were always reminded that islam was the truth and you did not believe that so you were a second class or you're third but they weren't like the christians who would come in and kill everybody <laughs> shouldn't say that but but no i mean like when you had the the crusader wars in the middle ages and the christians show up in the area they take jerusalem from the muslims and they you think, ah, oh, hey, 
we're free. No, they kill everyone, every non-Christian in Jerusalem, especially the Jews. So this system was politically savvy and merciful while sticking to their principles that Islam was the truth. So Umar helped establish political and military stability, but he wasn't a very much loved figure. He was more feared. He was more respected than he was a lovable figure. And, you know, this, this cause he does, and he's the first caliph who is killed. He does not die a natural death. He is murdered by another Muslim. I forget the reason why. I, I, Knew the reason why, but I, I, I forgot it. But anyways, he, he was, uh, so we, and we start seeing this trend because after him, every other of the Khalis, Uthman and Ali will also be assassinated. Um, only Abu Bakr dies a natural death. Most of, most Muslims love um, Umar. They, they love his memory, I should say. They love his memory. As I said, he was more of feared than love, but they, you know, they extol his memory. You know, they praise his memory. But that, that group, that small, significant minority of Muslims that wanted Ali hate Umar. Why? Because as I told you, he's the one who got in the way. He's the one who stood up and argued for choosing the best man, which turned out to be Abu Bakr. And so, for example, Shiite Muslims, this small, smaller group, absolutely hate him for blocking Ali's claim to succession. They'll never, they've never forgiven him for that. This is a picture I took from a website. This guy who gives, uh, who gives, uh, I guess, tours or brings people tours to the holy sites of Islam. Although I'm, I don't know if we, I don't think we have any Muslims in either of my classes, so none of us could actually go because these are all sacred sites, which means they're forbidden to non-Muslims to go there. Um, nevertheless, he took this picture of the tomb of Muhammad. This is a picture of the tomb of Muhammad. Of Abu Bakr and Umar. I told you Abu Bakr was buried, buried next to Muhammad and also Umar. So there's a building in Medina, the city of Medina. You can go there if you're a Muslim and you can honor or pay your respects to the grave of the great prophet Muhammad, which is behind that, that screen, those, those great iron, iron doors. Um, in the doors, if you look at the picture, oh, before I do that, the numbers one, two, and three indicate the grave. So of course, number one is Muhammad. That's the door leading to Muhammad's grave. Number two is Abu Bakr, and number three is Umar. Within the doors are like these circular holes. Okay, um, there's like circular holes. There's, there's, you know, there's a hole in the middle, and around it, there, as you can see, there's metal. And you know, what you do is you go and you bend down, so you can, you know, whisper, "Peace be upon you, Muhammad." God's mercies and blessings be with you. Peace be upon you, Abu Bakr. God's mercies and blessings be upon you. So you pray God's peace upon their memory and upon them. Uh, God's blessings upon them. So that's a devotional activity. Um, and you know, this ref re refers back to uh, something in the textbook, which you might remember, that whenever, whenever the name of the Prophet Muhammad or any prophet like Jesus, David, Abraham, Adam, the first man is a prophet, um, whenever the name of a prophet is said, often or well, always, I shouldn't say often, but always a, a, a Muslim will say, peace be upon him. Sometimes they'll say it in Arabic, so you can miss it, you won't, you won't understand it, but they'll say it, you'll say it, Muhammad, peace be upon him, um, whatever. And if they're writing, as you know from the textbook, it will be abbreviated in English PBUH. You see this PB, you know, Muhammad, PBUH after it. That's the abbreviation in English for peace be upon him, just so that you know. So you pray God's peace every time on the name of the prophet when you mention it. And here at their, their burial site, you can, you know, pray over them through these holes. I mean, they're great doors. You can, I mean, by great, I mean G-R-A-T-E. You know, they're made out of metal. They're great. So you can see right through them. I don't know why you can't just, you know, like go up to the, you know, I mean, why, why do you have to say it through this little, but maybe, you know, this little hole, this, you know, but maybe it's considered more respectful. But anyway, this is what you do. So I thought it was interesting. So I preserved it. Got the picture in. 
Our next caliph is Uthman. Uthman. Uthman ibn Affan. Sometimes in English, you will see it spelled Othman, Othman, or Osman, Osman. I don't know if anyone ever came up to Othman and said, or Osman and said, we call him Don. <laughs> Ask him whether he was a little bit country or a little bit rock and roll. Then Donny Osman. Uthman. Gotta make my own song. Died in 655. He was an early convert to Islam, and he married two of Muhammad's daughters. It was under Uthman that the conquests of the Islamic empire reached their peak, at least during the caliphate. Okay, see Abu Bakr in this early caliphate, and then under the following caliphs, especially Uthman, we have these borders here, and you have the dark, really dark gray, which is the early caliphate, but then the lighter gray, still darker, lighter dark gray, and then the lightest dark gray, but that has to do with like the Umayyads who come after the caliphate, um, the four right divided caliphs. Okay, so that's the light, light gray. So this region here, these borders, northern Africa, Egypt, Syria, Armenia, going to Persia, around Persia, that's the farthest extent during Uthman, during the Caliphs, I don't know why my phone is vibrating when I turn it on. Anyways, the, the uh, conquest reached their peak. Uthman was an older gentleman, and an, an older man, and he really couldn't, uh, I, I'm not saying it was, it was due to his age, not trying to be negative towards old people, but I think you know the implication is his age had something to do with it because of his elderliness and, and the age with, in which he was elected caliph, he just couldn't cope with the pressures of being khalifa. And so he relied a lot on family members, the members of his own clan to do the work. And this angered people because it led to charges of nepotism and corruption. Nepotism is when for example, you're in a position of power, um, influence, and you you uh, you know you do things to give that power to family members. Okay, so um, if you're in a position of power, like a politician, the most obvious example would be like a politician, who you know, the town he's the mayor of the town. They need the local dog catcher. You know, okay, I'll put my brother in the position. You know, I just put him in there. I won't you know, put an ad out for anybody. I won't take interviews. No, nope, my brother will do it and he'll make a nice little, nice little tidy sum and won't have to do much work. Or even better if there's like a committee or a council for like the utilities where you just meet once a month and at the local restaurant and don't really have to do anything, but you get a few thousand bucks as a stipend for serving on it. I'll give that to my cousins, stuff like that. It's corruption. Um, I know to mention that, that you see that or saw nepotism in uh, when I talked about Martin Luther, and I showed you that picture of Pope Leo X, right, with his cousin. I think it was his cousin who later became Pope Clement VII. Um, and yeah, he made him a cardinal, you know, which gave him an income in the church. He didn't have to do much, but he had money. You know, got to walk around in frilly things and look nice and not do very much, but he had an income in, from the church. So nepotism, corruption. Um, I'll think about that later. So people were not happy with that. But I mean, in Uthman's defense, I mean, if he couldn't handle it, you know, he needed advisors and he trusted people from his own family. Um, but it just didn't look good to outsiders. And so people didn't like that. So, I mean, people like our friend Ali, one of the blood relatives of the prophet Muhammad, and also that that person, Aisha, Aisha, who was one of who was one of the wives of the Prophet Muhammad. In fact, his favorite wife, both Aisha and Ali, kind of came together in an alliance to oppose Uthman. They said that Uthman was not following either the will of God or the will of Muhammad. So he had some trouble, some troubles brewing. What bring what kind of what brings Uthman down? Well, what brings Uthman down in, in the final 
straw for a lot of Muslims was the Quran. Um, under Uthman's caliphate, he oversaw the production of an official edition of the Quran, after which all other editions were destroyed. Now you might say to me, well, you know, Mr. Dunn, doesn't it mention in the Quran the book, the book, it talks about the book Muhammad received, and you've even said, you know, he talked about the book of Allah and his farewell sermon, you know, so yes, so there were, there was some kind of written rebel, you know, people did write down um, Muhammad's revelations piecemeal, people would write stuff down as Muhammad received a revelation or something. So, I mean, it was written down, but there wasn't really a standard Quran yet. I mean, things have been collected together, but nothing really officially. So there were versions of the Quran. There were things that had been pieced together from the revelations um, that Muhammad had received. So with Uthman's attempt to kind of bring it all down into one standard Quran, this was a novelty. This is an innovation and it was dangerous and would spell his death. Why? Because while the Quran had been written down to a certain extent, as I said, there was no standard text and the most common way of, for the Quran to be transmitted was through, again, orally. Think about oral tradition and stuff like that from, we find this in all religions. Um, yes, the Quran was, there were written portions of the Quran that had been collected, but the most common thing was recitation. For example, Abu Bakr, the first caliph, he just knew the Quran from memory. He had memorized all the revelations that Muhammad had received, and from memory he could recite them. And that was the common way the Quran was read, if you want to put it that way, and how it was passed on. You had this whole group of people called the Quran. Remember, Quran means recitation, to recite. Recite, Muhammad. Recite from Surah Chapter 96, remember? Angel Gabriel says recite. So the reciters, there was this whole group of people that had learned the Quran by heart and would recite it. However, they didn't all recite it exactly the same way. <laughs> so you had different versions of the Quran, different recitations, and you even had different written versions of the Quran. They were not all exactly the same. And that's what Uthman wanted to get rid of because there's a, a theological problem there because, you know, if, uh, you know, if this is the, the literal verbatim revelation of God that Mo Muhammad did not create, he just recites. Remember, he sees the revelation and he, from God and he recites it. It's God who wrote it. And so therefore it's perfect and verbatim from God. If that's the case, then how could God give two or three or four different recitations? Even if they're only minor, doesn't matter. It's still the same God and it should be perfect and the same all the time, even with the written version. So that was a problem. That was a theological problem, which he wanted to get rid of, but also it, it, had, a, it had the unattended effect that, yeah, but these are all apparently the literal verbatim words of God. So if God gave three different recitations of a verse from the Quran or a chapter of the Quran, the idea is they're all from God. Who is Uthman to say which one actually comes from God or that God only intended one and not all of them? Because you know, Arabic, Arabic words can have a whole texture of meaning to them. So, and, and of course you're burning, if you believe it's the word of God, you're by him destroying the copies, burning up all the other copies other than his one standard text, you're burning up the word of God, you know, <laughs> which is like blasphemous. Apostasy. Woo! Someone's gonna die. So he does this. This act of standardizing the Quran, as well as the other things I mentioned, the charges of corruption, spell the end for Uthman. And so a Muslim, an Islamic army gets together, a bunch of Muslims get together, form an army. Um, and uh, they come up, and then you have what's called the Siege of Uthman. Uthman is in his building somewhere, well, Medina, and uh, this Muslim army shows up and says, we don't want you no more. And so they capture him and they kill him. So goodbye, Uthman. Uthman's death was a turning point for Islam. The, the unity of the Ummah was now at an end. Uh, their unity in faith and their unity of relationship was now over, and a period of schisms and civil wars began. 
especially with this man, well, I shouldn't say especially, obviously with this man, because he's the next caliph, Ali, Ali ibn Nabi Talib, who dies in 661. As I already told you, Ali was Muhammad's nearest living male re relative. He was his cousin, and he was also his son-in-law through marriage. And Ali was thought highly of by Muhammad. He's one of 10 people, I believe in the Quran, to whom Muhammad promises a place in paradise in the afterlife. So apparently Muhammad did favor him and like him. Because of his courage and his ferocity in battle, um, he received the nickname of Haidar, the lion, Haidar, the lion, so Ali, the lion. He was not chosen, obviously, in the previous, also obviously, in the previous three caliphates, okay, because he had Abu Bakr, Umar, and Uthman, so Ali was not chosen. However, he was a faithful dude. He was a faithful person. That kind of shows you something of his character, that he didn't just pack up his marbles and go away angry. No, he stayed as an advisor to each of the caliphs. And now it was his time. After the murder of Uthman, he was offered the caliphate. At first, Ali turns it down, but then he accepts it and everything breaks apart. There's complete civil war amongst, uh, amongst the community. There are others who think that they should be caliph and you have just issues. Um, so after Uthman's death, civil war breaks out and you have people, some, as I told you, some people think that other, another person should have been Khalif, but this person, Aisha, who had allied herself earlier with Ali against Uthman, Aisha didn't like Ali. <laughs> she was not his friend. I mean, she was his friend against Uthman, but she did not like him. And she starts stirring the pot. As soon as Ali gets, gets elected Khalif, she starts stirring the pot against them trying to say that somehow Ali was complicit in the assassination of Uthman. So from the moment that Ali becomes caliph, he's engaged in constant warfare against other Muslims who are trying to take him down. And one of those Muslims, I told you, a Muslimah, Aisha, the favorite wife of the prophet Muhammad, you have this famous battle called the Battle of the Camel in 656, where a bunch of Muslims get together. They're going to throw out Ali. They're going to fight Ali. And Aisha shows up riding on top of a camel. And here comes Aisha, the prophet's wife, one of the prophet's wives, his favorite wife, saying, kill Ali, baby, take him down. I mean, it's surreal if you think about it, the siege of the camel. Um, she's there to kill, uh, if she can, I guess, the successor of her husband, the prophet, the man who believes it, should believe has succeeded to her, her husband, the prophet, but I guess she doesn't believe that. Um, Aisha gets shot with an arrow and wounded, and she doesn't die, but Ali places her under house arrest for the rest of her life, so she can't cause him any more trouble. <sighs> But Ali was not a good administrator. I mean, Ali apparently was, is, in the things that I was reading about him, was kind of a religious purist, a utopian. He wanted the perfect Islamic society, you know, the perfect Islamic society, um, rather than being a pragmatist. So he wasn't, he wasn't a very good um, uh, politician, you could say. He had no political skills. He was focused on a pure religious Islamic state. And so he did things that, you know, may have made sense to some extent, but didn't really work practically or pragmatically. So, for example, you know, the problem with Uthman was that he was corrupt. He put fa allowed family members to be put in positions of administrators throughout the empire where they could get wealthy and have power. People hated that. However, and so, well, Ali was like, OK, we'll get rid of them. I'll take get rid of them and put in new people that I choose who will do the right thing. Problem was is that some of those administrators that Uthman put in charge of parts of the empire were actually good administrators. They actually did good jobs, okay? Whereas the people that Ali put in after them, after getting rid of them, might have been 
pure according to his standards, but they weren't good administrators. So his reasoning might have been good, um, even righteous, but it, pra pragmatically it turned out to be a disaster and made people angry. There was one, what leads to his death? Well, how does his death come about? Um, there's one battle um, in Syria, well, Syrian soldiers, but anyway, um, where uh, this group is opposing him and they're fighting him. And the soldiers take their copies of the Quran, copies of the Quran that they have, and they stick them on their spears, the, the ends of their spears, and they lift the Quran up with their spears, you know, and, and to show Ali. Now, why are they doing this? The reason they're doing this is they're telling Ali they want arbitration. This should be our standard. Let's not fight anymore. Let's end fighting. We'll sit down with your representatives, with our representatives, with only the word of God, the Quran in front of us, and we will, we will let that arbitrate between us and how we decide whether you should continue with Khalifa, there needs to be some change, whatever, okay? Now, Ali, again, makes a decision that, I guess, for me, I think that it was a good decision. I, I respect it, but it led to his death. Ali decides, yes, I'll arbitrate with them. I can understand why he would have done that. It's Muslim brother killing Muslim brother. We need to stop this. This is crazy. Um, so yes, he decides that he will arbitrate with them. He will accede to their demand. Um, however, what this does is it completely loses his respect amongst his, his army, his soldiers, and those his bodyguards. And so you have a rebellion within Ali's army amongst his soldiers who think, no, these people are opposing the Khalifa of the prophet. They've turned away. They're apostates. Thus, they must be killed. You don't arbitrate with apostates. You kill them or bring them back into Islam. And since Ali doesn't do that, does that mean Ali's an apostate? Ali's lost it. He's lost the faith. He's turning back, walking back, walking it back. They thought so, and so, and this group is mentioned several times in the chapter, the Karijites, the, they get this name Karijites, um, who rebel against Ali. So now Ali has to put down a rebellion within his own soldiers. It's bad enough he's being attacked, attacked by other groups of Muslims. He has to put down that, which he does for the time being, but they, they, they never forgive him for doing that, for submitting to arbitration with, uh, with his enemies. And so, Later on, he is sometime in the future, I don't know how long it was, but later on, not at that time, but later on, he's one time praying in the mosque. He's at prayer. And this Karajite soldier comes in and kills him in the mosque. And so Ali is dead. And that ends the Arashidun. As I said, after that, yeah, basically chaos about who the you know who should be caliph and whatever, and um, so it's not the same thing after the four caliphs or the one caliph, depending on which group you belong you belong to. Um, so you know, I'll end it here with that. There's one final point that I would I would mention. Anyone who is paying attention to the news in the last ten years or so. during even going back into the Obama administration. That might be a little bit too far back for some, but maybe you, you remember something from the news. You might remember the, the war in, in Syria and in parts of Iraq, okay? And, whoops. Oh, wait. Sorry, I didn't mean to say that. Holy week. Um, Actually, there are two things I wanted to mention. Sorry about that. But the caliphate is still with us because the, the war that happened in Syria just within the last 10 years and destroyed the country of Syria, the modern day country, because they said it was a civil war, but it really wasn't. But the whole country of Syria and a large portion of northern Iraq here was taken over by this group of Muslims called ISIL or ISIS which was an acronym for the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant, or the, I, I, uh, the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. The Levant is a name for this region of the Middle East, okay, it's called the Levant. 
Okay, so ISO, sometimes you'll hear them called ISIL, sometimes you'll hear them called ISIS. What were they doing? I mean, this was in the last 10 years. They were trying to get back to this. They were trying to restore the caliphate. In fact, they elected the khalifa. They actually went and elected a guy as what they considered the legitimate khalifa of the Prophet Muhammad. And they started a war. They started taking territory. And at one time, as I said, they controlled large portions of Eastern Syria, large portions of Northern Iraq. And they were killing people who were non-Muslims. They were enforcing Islamic law as they understood it. So there, that's the caliphate. It's still with us. It's not, I know I'm talking about the seventh century, but it's still there. And there are, there are groups within Islam that want to that feel the need has to come back in some way, shape or form. The second thing I wanted to point out to you that I forgot though, when I did it at the time was this, just very quickly, but it's interesting. And it might show up on a test, so. Wink, wink, wink. <laughs> it might, because it's interesting. I mentioned Uthman, yes, in the Qurans. As far as we know, I mean, there are, there are two, two Qurans that exist in a museum in Egypt that are pre-Uthman that have survived. I don't know if scholars have studied them, but I do have it in my notes. It's somewhere along the way I found out that information. Um, but they've been around. This copy actually comes from the University of Birmingham in the United Kingdom. These two leaves from a Quran. And these are actually apparently the oldest copy of a Quran we have. And it comes before Uthman. In fact, it's been carbon dated. It comes before the life of Muhammad. It predates Muhammad. And so some scholars wonder, you know, like, is, is this the Quran? How could the Quran be before Muhammad who received the Quran? And, and I, personally, I don't think that Muhammad plagiarized the Quran. I don't think it was a pre-existing book before he was born and he just took it. No. What, you know, with carbon dating, they're dating the, the, the material. They're dating the paper. And yeah, the paper, I think, obviously predated Muhammad's birth. And then later on, the message, you know, someone used the paper to write out the Quran later on. But this, this was just sitting in the library of Birmingham University in the United Kingdom, stuffed into another Quran. No one noticed it for like 100 or so years. And somewhere along the way, this was in the last few years, someone noticed it. They saw that this, the text. They could tell by the writing style that it was very, very old because you can date things by how people write because writing changes over historical periods. They could tell it was very old and, and it was a different script, I guess, from later Qurans. So they took it out, they looked at it and could see it was the Quran, the page, a couple pages from the Quran, and they tested the paper and lo and behold, it comes back from the time of Muhammad. So it's possible that this might have been written even during the time of Muhammad or sh certainly shortly thereafter very shortly thereafter. And from what I understand, it is a little bit different from the standard Quran, but you can compare it to the version that Uthman established after. But so I thought that was interesting. Even within the last few years, here we go, we're finding this from the, the beginnings of Islam. Okay, so God bless you all. Have a good holiday. If you're celebrating, otherwise have a good break, good rest. Thank you, yes, happy Easter. Christ is risen or will be, truly he is risen. Yes, miss. First of all, no essay, no essay. It's not an essay. I don't need an introduction or conclusion, nothing that formal. Just go through the questions one by one. And, and answer them one by one. And the word count doesn't count the questions, right? It only accounts for what you write. So okay. yeah, so if you like reproduce the questions, like this is question one and this is what you're asking, no, that won't count in the word count. So it, the easiest thing is just follow each question, one, two, three, four, and each portion of the question. Just go methodically through it. Yeah. Try not to, to over, I'm not saying you would, but try not to overthink it. Um, just, just answer the question. Okay. All right. Yeah, I got halfway through and then I had one question, so I just wanted to make sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think that, and in fact, what I um, have recommended to other students, if this helps, just before you go, um, as you know, as you're answering the questions and writing your stuff down, I suggest like, you know, writing stuff in sentences, just writing your thoughts in sentences, writing it out, answering things, and then it, I think it helps to go back over each one and say. 
which which session, which question does this really address? Does it question, go with question one, put a one next to it. Let's go with question three. And then you can highlight and move stuff into the groups, you know, all the ones, all the twos, all the three. And then it, I think it will help organize them because sometimes thoughts can come into your mind and you're answering another question in another place and you don't want to do that because you'll lose points. All right. Okay. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Yes? Okay. <laughs> That's fine. I said that question. I was wondering about the final. So, like, I know in the quizzes, when you like answer the question, click to go to the next one, you can't go back. And like, I understand that. Yeah. I was wondering for the final, since it is so many questions, would you like? Would you consider making it so you can like say instead of getting stuck on a question for yeah. a while and maybe losing time because you're gonna have to kind of answer like one every minute or so. Yeah, because um, you got, I'm assuming you got the announcement that it would be between 100 and 120. Yeah. It's not going to, it's not the other number. Mm -hmm. No, okay. Um, yes, yeah, so you get a minute of question. Um, yeah, I can consider that. I, I mean, I prefer not to, let me just, I'm not saying no, but just let me give my thinking. Yeah. There, I prefer, because it is an exam and not a quiz. And I would feel like if I were doing it on the exam, I'm kind of lessening the exam, where it's a quiz, I say no. Um, but I can see the benefit when there are so many questions that if I maybe made it because you have the option of making it all on one page. And I think that that allows people to go up and down. And I'm presuming it would allow you to change answers yeah. if you needed to. Um, so I will think about it. I'm not saying I will do it, but I will consider it. My thing was like, I even so much changing it, but like, say I hit one where I'm like, Maybe I can't find my notes, or I'm just like drawing a blank instead of like wasting time. And you're worried that the time is going yeah, away. Just skip yeah. Out That's what. Should I mention it? <laughs> no, I won't say anything. Um, I'm just thinking to myself. Sorry. That's that's not that's that's a valid point. That's not. Uh, I mean, I'm not saying that is that is a concern. I'm hoping that people won't need to use their notes. Yeah. Um, that should be the standard that a person should have studied and just go boom. I'm, I'm going into it. But I understand that I do allow it, so people might be like, it took me five minutes to find this in my notes. Um, okay, I can't say yes, but I will think about it. So All right. I'll take I think it seriously and I'll think about yeah, it. That's fine. Thank you. I just figured I'd ask to see what your thoughts that, are. That's fine too. Thank All you. Right. Yes, miss. Hi. Um, I was just asking some I think ask some questions for the first speaker. Okay. Um, I think you've already like answered it for someone else. Uh, where one like there's a Buddhist um meeting they sent an email so I heard you saying something about saving it as a PDF mm -hmm. maybe you just want to upload it as a PDF yeah okay. yeah that's fine I just wanted to be sure just in case I did it wrong or maybe yeah um because I forget what the issue was with with them um because I, I I think I asked about the very I have to go back and look at my email but anyway the upshot of it was that they I just said you know if you could just send me an email and tell me the person came, but you know, or I don't know. If, actually, maybe I didn't say that. I think I might have said send it to the person, just telling verify and saying you know you did come or whatever. But if if you contact them, if you don't have anything, just you, could you send me an email saying yes, so and so came, you know, to attend the Zen meeting. That's fine, and uh, you, you know how you can print it out and save it. When you're printing it out, you can have the option of saving as a PDF or something. Mm -hmm. And just yeah, you you know how to upload it like that with your work, and that's fine. Oh, I was yeah. just was gonna ask because I didn't know if it was the right way or not. Oh yeah, it's yeah, because you know the the why because you thought it would have to be the verification form. Yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You know, I shouldn't say. I'm just trying to make things. I thought I was making things easier, and you know, then because I I could have just said you know. Figure it out, you know, find a way to do it yourself. You have to get verification, find some way to do it, and then I'll judge later what it what I like. So I thought I'd create something. Mm -hmm. And it seems like it made more problems for me than than it actually solved, unfortunately. So that's my rant for the for the day. But yeah, this if you, if you can get an email, just something verifying it. If they don't want to fill out the form, that's fine. Just as long as they can give you an email saying, I test the person to come, fine. I think that was the issue. Like some people, like when they read it, they thought that the verification form was like it has to be filled out. I think that was the like confusion with it. Yeah. Well. Yeah. yeah well, I think what I was trying to say was yes, it does have to be filled out. Like it's required. Yeah. Like 
I don't, I didn't want to leave it like a person could do it or not do it. But yeah, you're right. And then you get the, the issue of people. So it ha but it has to be this thing. You know, I can't get an email. I can't, no, you, you can get an email from me. That's fine. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Have a nice Easter. You too. Have a nice Easter. Christ is risen. Whoops. I want to do that. <laughs>